Good evening. Welcome to the Tuckahoe Town Meeting. This is, of course, Monday, May 14th, 2018, and I'm Pat O'Bannon, the Tuckahoe Supervisor. Got some interesting topics to talk about tonight. Uh, first thing I want to mention, though, is if you haven't signed in, please go ahead and sign in at the register. That way you'll get postcards in the future about the town meetings and other events that we have for Tuckahoe. Um, I'd first like everybody with a show of hands, how many people learned of this meeting with a postcard? Okay, how many learned of it on uh, Facebook? And how many on Nextdoor? And where else did you learn of it? Where did you learn of it? Oh, okay. And, and who, where do you live? Roslyn Hills, okay. Um, Tonight's meeting, we are going to talk about um, some topics. The first is the county's budget. And I wanted to talk about that because so many people say, you know, we want to know what's going on and what the money's being spent on, but mostly because it's your money. And if you are concerned about how it's spent or you think there's a better way to do it, you could make a comment now and it will go into the record and, and the board will discuss it. And that's how sometimes things get done. And we make changes. Another is the community maintenance issues, and that's where we have uh, someone here from community maintenance that will talk about the, the new initiative that the board has made, uh, sidewalks, public transportation, and real estate assessments. And that's pretty much what we're going to cover. And the real estate assessments one is because you've been reading in the newspaper about some areas of the county, the values have gone way up and some haven't, but that's pretty typical. And we're going to talk about that when that one comes up. So we have a whole lot of folks here from the county. Um, oh, again, before we begin, I want to mention some booklets that are in the back. The first is about the Real Estate Advantage Program. If you are, um, if you are, your income is limited and you are retired and there's some, other there's some other ways to qualify for this, this is a reduction of your real estate, what you pay in real estate taxes. It's a really good program. You'll hear a little bit about that during the budget discussion. Uh, we also have code enforcement. And again, this is community maintenance and community revitalization. And it talks about things such as uh, automobiles that are not, um, what is it, inoperable automobiles and things like that and how the code gets enforced. And this is about weeds and grass. We get that a lot in Tuckahoe. People calling that neighbors aren't cutting their, their lawn. And uh, another is a really good booklet, a book, that's the County of Henrico's Homeowner's Enhancement Guide. And it's a really interesting book that shows the different types of houses. A lot of them are in the Tuckahoe District and how the houses can be spiffed up or changed or with some color or shutters or maybe adding a front porch. And with just a little bit of work, it changes the value of the house dramatically and it brings it up to date. And this book, by the way, is available at the library. It can be taken out at the library, or it can be purchased, and I know it's also available online. Isn't it, Mr. Johnson? It, it's available. It's available to download online, but I think it's about, it's at least 50 pages. So it's better if you could take it out at the library. But reading that is interesting for a lot of reasons. Now, our first speakers tonight are uh, Brandon Hinton, who is who is the Deputy County Manager for Administration, and our Budget Director, Justin Crawford. And we also have with us uh, some police officers. I would like them to come forward for just a second and talk to us just a minute about the, the um, community officer program and how that works. If, and if, okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Green. I'm one of the sergeants in the Community Policing Unit. Um, it's a unit made up of about 18 officers. Uh, each one of the officers is assigned a particular zone in the county. And we like to refer to them as the chief of police for that little area where they are. And um, the unique part about their job is they're not tasked with answering calls for service, traffic crashes, alarms, and things like that. They are all empowered to work very independently to come up with long-term or short-term strategies to deal with uh, issues that can't be handled by one visit from a patrol officer. So we focus more on long-term community health, community relationship um, 
community relationships and partnerships. And it's my pleasure to be here, and I'll be in the back, and I'm going to stick around. If you have any questions about anything at all related to the police, I'll be glad to answer them for you. Good evening. I'm Captain Don Lambert, and I am the commanding officer of the West Patrol Station. So the difference in what my folks do and what Jeff's folks do is I kind of equate to the rescue squad. My folks do immediate triage and transport. So if you get a traffic crash, uh, alarm call, suspicious people, whatever, they come and treat the problem right then and right there. If, however, your problem requires a longer-term solution, then we collaborate with the folks in community policing who give us long-term treatment and care of that issue, more so than our patrol guys have the time to do because they're answering radio calls. hope that makes sense. So that's how we partner together to uh, work in your neighborhood. So the West Station basically is everything south of Staples Mill Road all the way to the river. So where you are tonight is in the West Station. So uh, we have the most populous area of the three patrol stations. We handle about half of the calls of service, just under half the calls for service in the county. So um, if you have any questions, I will also be in the back. Thank you. Now I think we'll go ahead and start our presentation. And Justin Crawford is our budget director, and he's going to speak tonight uh, briefly, and then we're going to move on to the other topics. But he's going to speak about the budget, the county budget. Now, this budget was started on probably just about a year ago. And uh, it begins with in, inside the county government, the different departments go over things they need or, or things that they understand they can get or whatever. And I can tell you a lot of this is, is um, salaries and things that are, are mandated by either the state or the federal government. But when the county starts talking and things shift or change with discussions with the board, usually December, January, just as they did this, this past January, where he, we had a two-day retreat for the board and discussed lots of issues, one of which was increasing and improving bus service. But Justin's going to talk about our general budget this year and what's happened with it and where the money's going to go. Good, e good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Justin Crawford. I'm the budget director for Henrico, have been for a little over a year now. I succeeded Mr. Hinton, who's now the Deputy County Manager for Administration. Um, I sometimes joke that in order to fill his big shoes, I needed to triple up on the socks. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, I am here to speak of the fiscal year 2019 budget highlights. And I like to state that the budgets that the county has are a continuing ongoing story and it Henrico has a really good story to tell and we started with uh, the priorities that uh, we build the budget on for example honoring prior funding commitments you'll hear a bit about the 2016 bond referendum and many of the projects that are underway and will be will be in operation within the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, enhancing the county's economic development efforts. Uh, we're trying to bring new jobs uh, to our residents and, and reduce the burden on, uh, the tax burden on residents by being, being able to uh, keep the uh, commercial tax base healthy. Allocating funding for our core services, primarily education and public safety, and, uh, and then also maintaining uh, the, KISS, the county's fiscal structure. We are one of 44 counties in the country that have the highest bond rating uh, allowed by all three rating agencies. This is better than the federal government in the state of Virginia at this point. And then also, last but definitely not least, uh, maintaining a competitive uh, uh, salaries and benefits for the employees who are the primary uh, service providers. They're the ones doing the work within our community. They are uh, police officers, our teachers, our firefighters, sheriff's deputies. Uh, you know, without our employees, uh, none of the uh, work that the county does uh, would, would get done. 
And we do this within a uh, low tax burden, in fact, the lowest in, of the largest localities within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and the key part of that is the real estate tax rate, which is the uh, which has not been raised within 40 years. In fact, over that 40-year time frame, it is the real estate tax rate has been reduced six times. I mentioned continuing to uh, a commitment to a business-friendly environment and enhancing economic development uh, efforts. One of the big things we did in that area was increasing the uh, business license tax threshold from or BPOL from 200,000 to 300,000. Uh, in doing so, over 13,000 businesses uh, will not have to pay this tax uh, effective January. Uh, and the move from 200,000 to 300,000 uh, fully exempts another 900 businesses but impacts uh, all of the businesses, uh, 6,000 that uh, were still uh, paying the tax. So it's a this is a great thing. It's something that we're going to continue to look at moving forward with the uh, with future budgets as uh, to try and see if we can continue to provide the you know, enhance our economic development efforts. Uh, this pie chart here just shows you how the county allocates the general fund budget. And as you can see, over three quarters of the budget, 77 percent, go to education and public safety. And that is not an accident. That is reflective of the board's and the citizens' uh, priorities. Uh, 21 cents of every dollar goes to public safety, with 56 going to education. Uh, the budget for the school board was, uh, you know, they requested a, an amount this year, and that amount was fully funded. With 21.5 million in overall incremental resources, um, and again, you know, three quarters of all that, all of the new incremental growth going to uh, education and public safety. Uh, 10.1 million of the incremental new uh, resources were, were for public safety, and we'll uh, delve into a little bit more of that. Uh, for the division of fire, we this is really exciting program. We are uh, implementing a, uh, a BLS response. So uh, taking uh, you know, really what we're doing is right sizing our response model and being able, you know, if someone uh, has a low acuity uh, call which doesn't require a, you know, a, a you know, full fire engine and ambulance, you know, all sirens response, um, this is the first phase to be able to uh, let, uh, get that uh, kind of have a lesser response, well, not a lesser, but uh, you know, a right response, you know, something more efficient. And it's a multi-year effort. The first year is $850,000, and we're really excited about this. Uh, also have uh, three new firefighter positions. $2 million for um, the planning efforts for the Staples Mill Fire Station, which was an approved project in the 2016 bond referendum. And then we're also making sure that our firefighters have the necessary equipment uh, <coughs> in order to do their jobs with uh, $1,250,000 for the apparatus replacement fund. Uh, the sheriff's budget, and I, I noticed the sheriff here, and. Um, what he can, uh, yep, Sheriff Wade. <laughs> but <clears throat> you know, over the past couple of years, we've had uh, an increase in our jail population, largely uh, because of the opioid epidemic, and uh, so we've have a a number of things that we have added to the budget to address uh, their those needs. For example, 500,000 for uh, cost to provide food for the inmates, um, 912,000 to to full uh, fund in the budget and agreement to house uh, female inmates down in uh, Chesterfield. That's a, a, a great.
great little partnership that hopefully is a temporary uh, one in nature because of the three million dollars that uh, we're setting aside in the capital budget uh, to uh, build an orbit facility. Uh, now if you if you're unaware of the orbit program, it's a it's a program that takes inmates with addiction issues who are looking t uh, to re recover from those uh, addiction issues and uh, allows them to go through multiple phases where uh, you know, eventually, you know, eventually lets them work uh, out in the community, uh, first starting with around the county facilities and then uh, eventually uh, out in the work release program. So this, uh, you know, this facility would help uh, move those folks out of the uh, out of the regular jail and into their own facility. And uh, again, it's an, another project that uh, we're excited about. And then the the two hundred eighty thousand dollars for the GPS monitoring. Uh, this is also to help uh, keep um, inmates out of uh, the jail who uh, maybe don't necessarily need to be there. Uh, Mrs. O'Bannon mentioned uh, transit and. The fiscal year 19 budget uh, provides the largest locally funded uh, expansion of transit services in over 25 years. Uh, it does it in, a, in a three different manners. It extends uh, weeknight hours uh, for bus service. It expands into weekend service, and then um, for a three, and those are for three routes: the Seven Pines connector, Laburnum connector and then the Pemberton route. And then the expansion also extends the Pemberton route from Pemberton Road out to West Broad Marketplace out in Short Paul. Uh, again, this was uh, a num you know, $1.2 million was added to the budget for this uh, in the 19 budget. And, uh, but this also isn't the only thing that we're doing in the area of public works. Uh, we have a number of uh, projects lined up. Uh, the first one up here is the Woodman Road extension from Greenwood Road over to Brook Road. Uh, this one, uh, we're looking at nearly $5 million. It's added to the fiscal year 19 capital budget for that. Uh, expansion of Oakley's Lane, the start of funding for that project at $500,000. Uh, countywide pedestrian improvements. Uh, this is local funding. That has been. This is the second year this money has been in the budget for uh, sidewalks and bike paths. Uh, and what this funding actually allows us to do is leverage it to pull down state and federal grants uh, to be able to uh, build out the uh, what I would say is a pretty aggressive uh, sidewalk and uh, pedestrian improvement program. Um, one of the you know, we've got 21 million dollars or 21 miles of sidewalk currently uh, underway with about 19 miles planned to be done over the next few years so uh, really you know it's a really aggressive push there and then we have a million dollars in local funding for other road construction projects as uh, uh, they come up uh, this is abandoned also alluded to this earlier in her comments but the fiscal year 2019 budget uh, uh, sets aside $2 million for what we're calling a community revitalization fund. And what we're going to be able to do here is to, uh, it, it provides some flexibility for the county to be able to address uh, you know, older neighborhoods that uh, you know, need maybe a, a little bit of a boost. So uh, you know, the, the county could possibly uh, purchase a, an old abandoned house such as uh, the one you may have heard of uh, on Delmont Street in the Fairfield District recently. Uh, it also uh, gives the county the flexibility to uh, partner with a, five, with a nonprofit organization um, to help uh, improve a, a neighborhood or you know, really uh, just gives the county a resource to be able to help address some of our older neighborhoods. And, and then we also have, we, 
the budget also expanded the uh, Real Estate Assistance Program, or REAP, which provides tax relief to uh, senior citizens and disabled citizens who um, qualify uh, under a certain uh, income and uh, worth parameters. Well, financial parameters, and so the five hundred thousand that was added to the budget, all while recognizes some of the increasing costs, uh, just that were already there. It also uh, helps to expand uh, or increase the uh, thresholds uh, for a program that was already uh, the most inclusive within the Richmond area. Uh, we're increasing the income threshold from 67,000 to 75,000. And then the uh, net worth parameter, which um, excludes the value of your home and up to 10 acres of land from 350,000 to 400,000. And then one last note, uh, you mentioned the, many of the bond projects that are currently underway, but many of what was much of what was approved in 2016 was in the area of sports tourism and you know, it's one of the growing areas within our local economy uh, uh, provides a significant amount of uh, local spending and uh, tax revenue on an annual basis and uh, you know, with Greenwood Park having just opened and I, you know, I live just down the road and every time I drive by always seems to be busy and I'm not sure how uh, I'm not sure uh, there, I didn't know there were so many tournaments in the area or that could come to the area but if, you know, we also know that uh, we're missing out on about 52 million dollars of, of uh, economic impact on an annual basis just because of the tournaments that come to us that we don't have capacity for so over the next few years with uh, the improvements at Tuckahoe the Old Tucker Little League Park, uh, the further improvements of Greenwood, uh, the high school fields that are currently being renovated, three a year, uh, Freeman being one of the first three, uh, being able to replace those fields with the natural synthetic turf uh, and uh, expand the amount of, uh, uh, or the amount of time that they can be used the hope is that that 52 million uh, would end up being a lot less, and uh, the 47 be a lot higher. Hopefully, but with that, uh, that concludes what I my remarks. And uh, just to summarize, um, you know, every budget, you know, every dollar was uh, strategically placed and um, you know, and prioritized. Touched a little bit on it at the beginning, but you know, even you know, we uh, add you know, add it and maintain uh, a budget that is structurally balanced and uh, can that will be respected by the uh, rating agencies moving forward, and also you know, uh, rewards our the employees that uh, do the work for the county uh, by providing uh, a bit of a raise. So, with that. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer any of them at this or afterwards. Yes, ma'am. Well, the uh, Department of Public Utilities is, it takes every year any pipes underground, water, and sewer, they replace them. They just did the entire area of Beverly Hills, which is just there at Perriman Patterson. And um, they redid all the plumbing, I guess you could say, for the neighborhood, water and sewer. So the Department of Public Utilities it has everything on a schedule, much of which is out here in the near West End the area here. Uh, in talking to Dominion, 
we've been working for many years with Dominion. They have rebuilt the entire electrical grid for the, this part of the county, and they are currently putting it underground in the area behind St. Matthew's Church. It's right there at Forest and, and uh, Patterson, an area there. They just had um, meetings with the folks in there. So everybody knows that, that we're working on it. And, but they work on it. But, well, they've already done Beverly Hills. Now they're working on other areas, like in, in Mayberry and that sort of thing. They do it methodically. It, anything that's 60 years old or older. Um, the schools, Tuckahoe Elementary is 70 years old. They're celebrating 70 years, I think, this weekend. And um, they've totally gutted that school and renovated it from the inside. And then they had a fire and did it again. They, we, the county spent more than $2 million on, when it was in the, for the fire there at Tuckahoe, and pretty much did the ceilings again. I know that, and a lot of the, the equipment. Um, the, all I can say is, methodically, we, we are keeping it up very well. I mean, what, is there something specific? Maybe is that the one at, on on Roslyn Hills? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm And that's not true. I don't. The information you're receiving, well, the information you're receiving has been is partly correct and partly not correct. The county just purchased acreage to the side of the park to increase the size of that park, and it was just it, it was just closed on in, in April. Yeah. And that's the point I'm saying is that has not been approved. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. It was not eminent domain. It was arm's length, yes. It was not eminent domain. Yes. Yes, I can right now. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. Well, it wasn't the next thing, but it was one of the next things. Um, I've got the list. Uh, we have been infilling the sidewalks all over Tuckahoe, and I will say particularly down Quakison and other areas. But the um, the uh, mostly we've infilled sidewalks where there was a piece of sidewalk missing. Here it is, and we are working on John Rolfe Parkway which is Ridgefield Parkway to Gaten Road. That's 3,600 feet of sidewalk. It's $750 a foot. That's expensive. North Parham Road, which is three chop to Gateway East, 940 feet of sidewalk. Quakison Road, which is Blue Jay Lane to Starling Drive. That's 1,000 feet of sidewalk that's being added in. And that's partly to assist with the new bus service that's going down Quakison and Ridgefield Parkway from Pump Road to Falcon Ridge Drive, and that's 4,100 feet of, of sidewalk. Those are the, the are other projects in Three Chop, Brooklyn, Fairfield, and Verina, too, on sidewalks. But those are the, the biggest. Now, there's some that are smaller that are infill for sidewalks. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. They're all Tuckahoe. Lauderdale. Um, Okay. What area, what road, what, okay, what road, is, well, these are just ones on the list for now that we are following through on. I, I, I know about Lauderdale, but I don't know the exact spot, but I will say we've been infilling there, and part of it is when you put in a sidewalk, you have to have the road to the ultimate width, and hopefully there's curb and gutter, and on Lauderdale, I know the road is, is it, goes from two lanes to four lanes. Is that where it's two lanes? Okay. 
Edison. Well, <laughs> let me put it this. Well, let me put it this way. The I've talked to the. Uh, we don't have anybody here from Public Works. What we did earlier today, but um, the piece that is. It looks like it's four lane, but it's not. You know, the area that goes before in front of the school. Um, it's on a list to be improved. And. I don't think the school board pays it. <laughs> oh, with the parking lot. You mean the parking lot? <laughs> yeah. And the problem with that is it was it was not made to code or not made to standards and it'll all have to be ripped out and rebuilt. And the Department of Public <laughs> because it wasn't built to, to the standard, the county standard. Well, I'm not sure the. Well, let me talk about Regency since you mentioned it. The uh, over-under with the tunnel was there to, to, to allow traffic for, what, 40-some years. So, I mean, it, um, no, it was a matter of fact, it was used so much almost that, that trucks would hit it and would damage it and it had to be repaired. Uh, the, 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 the company that bought Regency, and that is on my list of things to talk about, but the company that bought Regency, number one, they wanted to level the road so that people can, pedestrians can go across the road and you can go from Regency to Walmart, the shopping center where Walmart is. Yes, you'll be able to walk across the street. They've brought it all the way down and it's supposed to open this week. The work has been completed and should open this week so people can move from Regency to the Walmart. Uh, at Regency, they are the Sears, Yes, by automobiles and pedestrians. Pedestrians will push a button and you can cross the street. It'll be a, it's flat. It's, it's at grade level. It's marked and everything. It should be. And um, they're doing that because they want to make that whole area pedestrian friendly. The, the people who own Regency, the company that's developing Regency. They're going to take Sears. Sears, of course, was purchased separately because Sears owned that. But they purchased that land from Sears the building and everything, that's going to be a, a movie theater. Uh, they are, they've already removed, as you probably can see, some of the two decks, the two-story parking lots, the two-story parking deck in that area. It's now grade level. They plan to have restaurants there. Starbucks is going to be in the old bank building. And Starbucks says you'll be able to drink coffee in the safe. They're going to remove the locks from the safe, <laughs> but you'll be able to go sit in the old safe at the old bank that was there, the former bank that was there. Um, they are going to have restaurants in the area and shops, but they are also going to come to the board and ask for a rezoning. It's currently zoned the highest level of business, B3, which means 24 hours, and you can have anything in there, including naked women bars. I've got jokes about that. But they've never done that because they are family friendly. And the gentleman that purchased it want people to live in that area, have offices in that area, and they're going to come to us for a change to urban mixed use. And while they have not decided yet what they're going to do, what they intend to do is have some sort of condominiums in the area. People will be living in that area too. There were 5,500 parking places in the Regency area, and they've cut that down because they anticipate people to come more coming and going, and, and park less, but live there, live, work, and play right there. The, the sidewalk issue with Quackison is going down Quackison past the, the schools and take it all the way to um, 
Gate and Crossing Shopping Center. So when that sidewalk project came up, that's the idea there. You can walk from Regency to Gate and Crossing. And there are people who live along there that wanted this. I understand about Lauderdale and what you're saying, but there's some other issues that I can get back to you on that about the other issues. But it's very expensive, and they would have to dig it up and redo the entire road. And I know it's been that way a long time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Glenside and Parham. At Broad Street, we are adding sidewalks, but it's very hard to make it pedestrian friendly to cross Broad Street. The board even looked at, and it was in the newspaper, we looked at building a structure where you go up and over. It's a you know, solid structure going up and over the road, which would be extremely expensive, but it's ex very difficult. Um, pedestrian friendly, there's some areas at uh, Glenside and Broad that are being developed right now. They, they were just approved for um, homes that are condominiums in that area on both sides of Broad. And yes, there are bus stops through there, and they have, they have signalization there, but it doesn't seem as, well, it's not as wide there. <laughs> It's easier to cross in that area of Broad Street near Glenside. It's between Glenside and Merchant's Walk Shopping Center is the area I'm talking about. There's signalization along there where there's a, um, yeah, where Lawrence Dodge used to be. But, I mean, there's signalization on Broad Street, and they'll be able to cross over and, because there are people who live in the area around there that do already cross the street at that signal and work in, the, in Merchant's Walk Shopping Center. So an area like that, you can get better walking in that area, but as you go further out broad, it's much more difficult. And as I said, we've been looking into ways to get people across the street safely. It is not easy. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Since we're going to talk about community maintenance, why don't we go into that right now? The position that's been discussed, as I understand, is going to be in the county manager's office and it acts sort of as a clearinghouse. There are a lot of questions, a lot of calls, a lot of complaints come into the county manager's office every day, and they have to be routed. And the more knowledge that somebody has about those issues, um, the easier that they can get routed so the person can fill that function. Also acts somewhat as an ombudsman if that kind of thing is necessary to follow up. Sometimes the complaints that come in involve multiple agencies, three, four, five agencies sometimes. So the problems as they get addressed are, can be rather complex, you know, to coordinate the various activities. So it is something that is, you have to have a certain amount of technical knowledge to understand, you know, how is this going to get solved? What agencies are going to be involved? What needs to be done? Um, so I, I think it's going to be properly placed. I think it's a position that's needed and, and something that's going to just increase the service level to citizens as they call in. And is, you want to? So if I could add a little more, it, this is also someone who's going to be working with, um, with 501c3s, get to know the 501c3 community, um, you know, someone who's familiar with affordable housing in the area, um, in you know, your, your Laura Lafayette's the world, your other 501c3s in the area. And really get to know. So um, I'll give you an example. Justin mentioned his presentation, the Delmont purchase. It was in the paper. It was highly noted. Uh, we spent fifty thousand dollars buying a piece of property that had become a problem. It was blight. Uh, it was uh, boarded up. There was a lot of criminal activity going on in the area. A couple of murders over a couple of years. There was drug activity. Just a bad place. The owner lived out of the country, is my understanding. 
uh, didn't pay attention to the property, so we purchased it from them, and now we're letting the citizens of Fairfield decide what's best for that area. It's on a corner lot. It's a great opportunity for a community asset, possibly, if it's a, um, uh, some sort of playground. It could be uh, if the, the bones are still good, the building inspections goes in and says this house is, is sturdy, it, it's capable of, um, of renovation. It could be we get a 501c3 to come in and make it an affordable housing opportunity. So that's what we're talking about with the community revitalization fund. Um, with the position itself, uh, I think a lot of why uh, was noted. A couple of years ago, we added a, a advocate for the aging. I kind of allude to the same premise. We have folks in, um, in the county who work with our senior population all over the county, but we don't have one person who coordinates every single purpose that we do between finance, between social services, between all the different agencies. It's given a, a central focal point, someone who knows it all um, in, in Henrico County, and not just Henrico, but across the region and what's best going forward. And uh, we're talking about $2 million. That's a lot of money. It provides a great opportunity for, uh, for our community, someone who knows the best way to maximize that resource. Uh, so the, the question was how we're going to evaluate the position. Absolutely. Uh, well, I can tell you, uh, this is just like, and I'll go back to the advocate for the aging. Uh, so, I'm sorry, repeating the question. It's, it's hard to do. It's, it's not natural. Uh, so, the, the question being, um, how are we going to evaluate the position uh, when it's a new position? It's, it's a great question. Uh, we're starting something different, something new. Uh, much like with our advocate for the aging, same thing. This is a new position. It's a new opportunity. It's really hearing from you, the citizens. Are they providing what you want? Um, are you seeing a difference in the community, the communities that we're serving? Are we doing a good job? We're going to listen to the 501 C3s. We're going to see, uh, are we making contact with, with everyone who can make a difference in our community? Um, you know, I would say, you know, I think the job's out there. If you want to go out to a Henrico Jobs, I want to say it's posted. If it's not posted now, it'll be posted really soon. It is, it is posted. So you can look at the criteria, what we're looking for in that position. I haven't even looked at it yet. I, was, I think it just got out there today. If I'm not mistaken, it was recent. Um, so evaluating, looking at those job responsibilities, um, and really hearing from our citizens, from from stakeholders in the community as to whether or not we're doing a good job. So the question is, how do we evaluate the Community Revitalization Fund one year in? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so I do know we have, we've evaluated already community revitalization has been key in looking at properties that are out there that are very similar to the Delmont property, ones that have criminal activity. Police has been involved. We have calls for service at these facilities as well. Delmont property is not the only property that's been an issue. So uh, step one, in my mind, and for this position, is to go and look at those properties. How can we turn these blighted properties, properties that are becoming a nuisance to the community, how can we turn those into a community asset? And to me, year one, it's going to hit the ground running. There's a lot of opportunities we've already identified. And we've done a lot of legwork for them. So it's up to that position to, to validate what we think we already know, but also working with these 501Cs and figure out so we've been involved in a very exciting project at the county, and it's a vacant house database. And, you know, people use databases for everything these days, so it's not crazy to think about that. But we've been working on it for about 18 months. It's up and running. We're starting to collect information about vacant houses around the county. And what we're doing, what this database is going to do is connect various county agencies to information that's stored in the database. We're all going to be working out of the database to identify the kind of project houses, uh, like, like the one that was just mentioned and doing it in a lot more efficient way. Also tracking the history of a vacant house. Being able to go, people from different departments being able to go into the database and to see what happened. With every vacant house, there's a story. Sometimes the stories are really crazy, you know, um, but there's a story behind every one of these vacant houses. And we want to come to understand those stories, track those stories, and whenever possible, when there's an opening for the county to do something positive, using the kind of funds that we're talking about, uh, we want to be able to do that. 
But one of the keys, of course, is tracking it, having the information, and having the staff who can work on that, that kind of thing. So it's sort of a new focus, a new emphasis for us. Okay. So I'm Paul Johnson, Community Maintenance Manager for the county, and I work in the Department of Community Revitalization. We work on trying to reduce and eliminate, um, call it visually oriented types of zoning violations, things that detract from the appearance of a neighborhood. And the kind of things that if they're left unaddressed, they spread, people get a bad impression of the neighborhood where these things are, appear, and uh, property values can become stagnant, or maybe people become so unhappy with the neighborhood that they, they decide they're not gonna invest. I mean, people are very, very rational. I've had this, this call hundreds of times in my position over the years where somebody will call and say, Mr. Johnson, I wanna sell my house. It's going on the market, but you should see the house across the street. And maybe they're actually going to actually leave a neighborhood because of that house across the street, or they've got a couple of those houses you know, in their neighborhood. They're very, very sensitive to that. Or even if they want to stay in the neighborhood, maybe they would think, you know, we've got those two bad houses on the street, like the one that Miss O'Bannon was talking about in Delmont. We've got those bad houses, so you know what? I'm not going to build that garage. I'm not going to put on the addition, or I'm not going to paint my house. We don't want anybody in Henrico County to ever feel like their neighborhood is not worth reinvesting in. So all of the things we do, whether it's a federal housing program, whether it's a code enforcement program, and I'll go through those just a little bit, whether it's a community cleanup program or volunteer program, whatever we're doing, we're applying resources to neighborhoods just to make them look great so people feel good and safe in, in their neighborhoods. We coordinate closely with building inspections, with the police department, and we have monthly meetings with those agencies to talk about the most difficult cases all trying to focus on reducing and eliminating these types of blighting influences in neighborhoods. So some of the things I'm going to mention that will, won't be of any surprise to you, tall grass and weeds. This is a very busy time of the year for us. If the grass gets, gets over 12 inches, that's a code violation. We can bring an abatement contractor if necessary to cut it. And that bill does go to the property owner. Trash and debris, we can abate that. The bill goes to the property owner. Road and control, in out from motor vehicles, you know, when they went to the two, two and three year sticker on in out promoter vehicles, I thought, you know, our problem's gonna disappear. We're not gonna have them. Because people are gonna, you know, no, there's more than ever. So I don't really understand that. Uh, we regulate boat trailers, pets, outside storage of indoor items. Sometimes people will buy a new sofa and for some reason the old sofa ends up in the front yard or on the front porch or in the driveway. That's the kind of thing we work with people on. Uh, wreckers parked in residential districts. They can be there to pick up a car, drop one off, but they can't be stored. Uh, signs, uh, businesses, we do work in commercial areas also. Uh, we do work with businesses that have to maintain parking lots, lighting, landscaping, everything you see on Broad Street, all the things that the Planning Commission approves, um, all those things have to remain uh, in place and in good shape. Um, trailers, motorhomes, boarding houses, overcrowding issues. So. When you think of that list, these are the kinds of things, if they're present in your neighborhood, you're not going to be very happy about it. So if you have some of these issues, feel free to give us a call. We, you can do it online. Yes, ma'am. 501-4757. <laughs> if uh, you get the answering machine, just leave a message, including a, a callback number, and try to leave the address of the property you're concerned about. The information does remain confidential. We don't reveal it to anyone. Um, we never reveal it. That's, that's our policy. We've even had wives turn in their husbands before. So, so that, you know, that's been tested. So, so we're out there every day. We have 11 inspectors. We've divided the county up into 11 zones. The inspectors are out there every day. They work proactively. Uh, this is something we started years ago. Proactively, countywide, when you average it out, we're about 60% proactive, which means about 60% of the cases that we work annually result from the inspector driving down the street and they see those three junk cars in the front yard and they stop and they leave a brochure on the door. And frequently that is the first contact somebody will have with us. They'll come home from work, there's a business card and a brochure. We call it the soft approach. We just want compliance. We don't want to necessarily take someone to court or bait, you know, the violation on their property. We just want to have a discussion with them, see the violation gets taken care of and, and work, uh, work with them on it. Yes, sir. Uh, we can we can uh, handle that if you have a concern. You could do that, yes, yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So the question is, uh, can our office process uh, complaints or concerns about landscaping that create a site distance hazard? 
And the answer is yes, we can, we can do that. So. so our staff are out there every day. We have the 11 field inspectors out there, about 60% proactive and you know, 30 to 40%, depending on the area, are, are complaint driven. Uh, we do not reveal complaints. We don't have to reveal complainants under state law, so we don't share that information. We've had people call us and ask us information. We just don't give it out, so don't worry about it. Yes, ma'am. It depends on probably what it is and where it is. So, uh, OK, like ash from a fireplace or ash from a, a, a furnace, a business? OK, like an industrial furnace or something. I, is it on private property or business property, residential property? OK. Okay, so a ash, if it's just particularly ash, is going to be regulated, will not be regulated by our, our office, but you mentioned junk uh, on the property. Obviously, that's something that we're interested in. If s okay. And you called DEQ and they told you that they couldn't look at it? To, I'm sorry, to call who? Call the county. Okay. 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 Well, it's generally not something that we would handle unless it were junk. It, it, you know, if somebody literally is dumping junk, I'm not sure about the ash, but if they're dumping junk, it could be an illegal landfill. But is this the property that's being developed that people are concerned about? OK. Kevin, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Good evening. My name is Kevin Wilhite. I'm a planner with the Development Review and Design Division at the Play Department. We do have a subdivision proposal that's actually been submitted about a year ago uh, called University Ridge, which is just off Zion Town Road adjacent to the park that's been referred to earlier. We are aware that there was dumping done on the site in the past. Uh, the development plans for the subdivision have, has to take that into account on what's uh, going to be done to mitigate the dumping that was there. Uh, we are aware of that, and that is something the staff is looking at. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. If uh, that property is developed as a subdivision, uh, we get information on what existing grades are there. Uh, that area, uh, as you are well aware of, drops quite a bit down towards the homes uh, on Roslyn Hills. Uh, if they develop it, more than likely they're going to have to do a lot of grading in that area. And most of that uh, material that's there, and we only have, you know, we know that there's something there. We don't know exactly everything that is there. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a real specific case that's currently work being worked on by the county. If you can stay after the meeting, otherwise we're going to take up all the time. We have three other presentations. 
if you can wait until afterwards. And that's why Mr. Wilhite is here. He's going to stay. So if you have, yes. And there are other meetings that we're, there are going to be several other meetings about that property, public meetings specifically for your community. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we are aware of that. The staff is still reviewing the most recent set of construction plans that have been uh, provided to the county. Uh, we're hoping to finish up our review this week and probably we'll meet with the developer a little bit later on and towards the end of the week. Uh, but there is the expectation that uh, there will be a community meeting if this project moves forward. Were there any questions about community maintenance issues, code enforcement, any concerns in your neighborhoods? Yes, me. Okay, so, uh, well, I w we would love to see Regency in, uh, redeveloped. We've been working with the owner for several years about the issues out there. Uh, that includes uh, multiple agencies meeting periodically to talk about the, the issues, the code violations, the, the police issues, and just kind of brainstorm about what we can do. Uh, some of that resulted in some court cases. Building inspections were very much involved. The owner is forced to make some improvements to the property, to the walkways, and to other, you know, other elements of the, the structures out there. There were zoning violations. In essence, the owner was turning it in, converting it from a hotel to an apartment building, and only the Board of Supervisors can make decisions to do that. That's a zoning decision. Um, so we worked with the owner. Uh, I, you know, we looked at this very closely. It's difficult for us to see how the owner is going to make it long term without operating it as an apartment building versus a hotel. So at this point, we're in a monitoring stage, and and I'll just say it: we go by it to the parking lot, you know, every week. You know, we're we're looking at the cars, we're collecting information. We may be working eventually towards another court case, you know, with the owner about that zoning issue. But a number of improvements have been made to the property. Uh, we were kind of wondering, and we actually did meet with the owner and explain to them and ask them, do you really think this is worth it? Because they made a substantial investment to solve the building code violations out there. And the owner has some, I, I would just guess, some kind of emotional connection to this building because they just kept reinvesting money into it. And uh, from my perspective, it didn't make sense, me and a lot of other people. But, but when you own property, you get to do things like that. You can put as much money into it as you want to. But, but staff are very concerned about it. Yes, sir. I don't know that it is for sale. Now, I do know that people have told me they want to buy it. More, more than one company has told me that they are interested in buying the property. So I, I don't know. Do you have something? Greg? Okay. So we know that there have been discussions out there. As I said, I've had, you know, had one person tell me directly that they wanted to buy it, and I've heard of others that wanted to buy it. So we would love to see that. One of the difficulties with that lot is that it has an odd configuration. Um, if you're asking me, I think the best use is probably to close the hotel and put a really nice restaurant in the built in the main building there. But we just have to let the market work. Uh, please understand that the county staff are going to stay on top of that. We're watching it. We're trying to make it safe. The police are trying to keep it safe over there, and it's just going to be an ongoing task for us. Thank you. That's Paul Johnson, 5014757. <laughs> There's several people in his office I, I know very uh, personally. <laughs> Sherry Gemmel is great <laughs> at getting things done. Uh, we, uh, talk, we talked a minute ago about sidewalks, and it's $2.5 million. The Richmond Regional Transportation Planning Organization, and I have a, a handout from them. This is a regional organization. Uh, they have funds money that will match when it, when it comes to sidewalks and bike trails, by the way. And I, for many years, I kept it real quiet, and I always managed to find money at the uh, MPO, which is what I call it, Metropolitan Planning Organization. And we, that's where we got all the sidewalk money, but now the county is putting up matching funds, and that's one place that we get matching money uh, for sidewalks. I just wanted to put that in there because this is a, one of the regional organizations the county belongs to. This is how we receive federal funding for things, uh, for some roads and some projects, such as Parham and Patterson. Uh, one of these days we'll get it done. Uh, I wanted to move on uh, 
to the, uh, in the improvements in the bus service that we have in the county. Uh, in 2008, the board and the city of Richmond began their discussions about how we could improve bus service. And in 2009 and 10, we began to do assessments by the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. And there were some policy boards that came about, technical advisory boards. And the groups met um, periodically from 2010 to 2014. And then in April of 2014, Henrico County signed on as the second jurisdiction to go for Tiger Grants. And so at that time, we agreed we would partner with the City of Richmond on improved bus service. And that's the bus rapid transit. Of course, in Henrico County, we were at uh, Willow Lawn, and we put air bus stop there at Willow Lawn. And what this has done, the BART, uh, bus rapid transit, has allowed us to, it has given us money back that we don't have to spend because the original bus service was like a spoken wheel. If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to go into the city to transfer to another bus. It's a very long process. And in doing that, the county would pay for anything from way out in the county into the middle of the city for bus routes. When bus rapid transit came along, it's a linear bus route that's permanent, and the buses go out from the linear feed of the uh, bus rapid transit. And by doing that, we got back some, we got back money from some routes, so we extended some. For instance, at Regency, it's going all the way now to Gate and Crossing Shopping Center, which is one of the reasons we wanted to put the sidewalks in there. And that was one of the, the impetus of, of getting more sidewalk along there. Um, some of the sidewalks, too, go from the northern part of the county down to uh, Willow Lawn again, uh, down Staples Mill Road, that sort of thing. So we could increase some of the bus service. Also, during the summer of 2017, the board discussed extending the bus routes uh, out to uh, Short Pump in the Short Pump area as part of this project. And the prices were involving um, anywhere from $800,000 to $87 million. <laughs> now, an $87 million project is, is pretty much undoable unless we had another bond referendum. And you could build three elementary schools, two middle schools, or one high school for that amount of money. And we were thinking, if we're going to use that money, that would be what we would do. Because the anticipation is that within a, at least the next 10 years, we're going to have self-driving vehicles, you know, driverless vehicles, and better taxi service. I'll talk about that in a minute. So increasing just regular bus service out to short pump was the $1.2 million, because it also changed some of the routes, the outer routes, to get people to Willow Lawn so they could go to short pump. So that was the selection we made, and that was in January. But we were talking, we've been talking about this, obviously, and Henrico had been doing our research since about 2014. So with that said, that's part of where the bus service improvements have come from. Uh, the taxi service is another interesting thing. Through the years, how many here know about care service? Or it's, it's a type of taxi service for people who are elderly or disabled? OK. Um, that was many people because, I'll just say it, in Tuckahoe, their average age is older than most of the rest of the county. Shucks. <laughs> but we've, I have had a lot of people call me about trying to improve taxi service. And this is because people have a walker. Possibly they're blind. They tell me that they really can't even walk two or three blocks to get to a bus stop. They really needed it curb to curb and on demand. The former care service, if you qualify, costs $3 for any taxi ride that you take from in Henrico and to within the city of Richmond. And it can be just about anywhere in those two areas. It's $3, which is a great deal. You can go to the doctor's office, grocery store, whatever. A lot of these people were using it to go to work every day. There are many people in Tuckahoe that are legally blind but who work downtown and of course, they can't drive. And so they like the taxi service. But you call three days in advance. With, tax, with care service on demand, which is what I was working on, about two years ago, I went to the regional transportation group that I mentioned that's in this flyer. We set up a, a, an ad hoc committee. And we discovered that what we needed really was um, a clearinghouse. You call one person at the desk or one person or group of people 
that would take your request. And if the console would show it, you could do this. You could set it up technically. The person at the console would know exactly where all the, the taxis that were participating were. Now, Uber and Lyft, you know, were taking over the taxi service in the area, you can imagine. And uh, they would, wouldn't take people in wheelchairs, and they weren't interested in people that were, had disabilities. And so we were going to go for a grant through the MPO. It's called 5310 grant, but we were going to apply for it. And the county had prepared the application when a company called UZURV, U-Z-U-R-V, you've, you've heard of them. Excellent. Please use them. <laughs> and people, they said, hey, we'll do it. And we're not going to charge anything. Of course, that left $500,000 on the table for Powhatan, Goochland, and Charles City, and New Kent to buy equipment for wheelchair access. So it was great. Um, so by a private company taking it over, they could do much more than the government could. And what they did was you call now, and within 30 minutes to one hour, uh, if you qualify for this, you can get that taxi because the person answers the phone, knows exactly where all taxis are in the area. Now, of course, what you're saying is many of these taxis, like Napoleon Taxi or Airport Taxi, well, Pat, they don't have wheelchair access. They got so they got really into this because Uber and Lyft were taking over their business. They really wanted to get in on it, so they're beginning to produ to purchase wheelchair accessible taxis. They're willing to take a course on going to the door, knocking on the door, and helping someone who is blind or disabled to the vehicle. This is really working out very well to take the demand taxi for elderly and disabled. Elderly, by the way, is at 80 years old. Okay. If you're 80 and with no disabilities, you can use this service, and it's $6 per ride. So it's a great deal, and I'm very pleased that that has happened and this private company took it over. So if you ever need a ride, call Userve and find out which taxi's closest, and they'll come quickly. Let's see what else was on here. Ah, real estate assessments. Who wants to, one of you guys are going to take that. Okay. Mr. Hinton's going to take this one. So uh, with respect to time and the, uh, the ugliness that's happening out there, uh, we'll be brief uh, with the real estate assessment conversation. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the process for assessing real estate. Of course, uh, every year, uh, finance, we have a, a division within finance, a real estate assessment division whose job it is to go around to our residential and commercial properties in the county and value those properties. And they take this information based on neighborhood sales, based on area sales, uh, other activities. It, it, there's a lot of factors that I can't even pretend to understand everything that goes into the assessment process. But uh, sales in the area are the primary driver of, of real estate assessments. And we are seeing, uh, even in, with our, our reassessments that came out uh, in, for January, we're seeing pockets of the county that are growing substantially. And some of you may be uh, one of those. Uh, we're seeing pockets that are growing 9 10%. But we're also seeing pockets that are still declining. And our average reassessment uh, across the county, countywide, was 4.7% for January the 1st. So we are seeing growth that is very positive growth, considering especially where we've been since the, uh, the economic downturn. Uh, what that also means, though, is that the budget director over here uh, has a challenge, and if we see continued growth, it, it, we're always looking at the real estate tax, as Justin mentioned earlier. Forty years is a, is a track record that we're very proud of, but six times in that 40 years, we were able to reduce that tax rate. Uh, if that growth continues, then we've got some really tough decisions to make, it, but it's, at the end of the day, we're going to be fiscally responsible, and there's a track record. Ms. Ban has been a part of a lot of those uh, tax rate reductions. Uh, where we're seeing uh, values increasing in the early to mid 2000s. I don't think we're going to see that again for a very long time, if ever, but uh, we are seeing continued growth. Uh, for it, you individually, if you have a property uh, and you think your assessment went up too much, uh, we actually, believe it or not, have folks that call in saying it didn't go up enough. Um, we really like this conversation, but we, even then, we'll go out and look at those properties and we will not increase if it doesn't. It has to be merited. Uh, but we do have staff to go out and analyze exactly uh, exactly that. Go in and see um, if you think your assessment went up too much. They'll go out and check and make sure. They'll look at stats and data and pinpoint that particular home and, and make sure that it was warranted. So please, um, the, the appeal process is very easy in the county. It's a simple email to our real estate tax division. Um, 
Justin, while I'm talking, if you could pull maybe um, um, Tom Little, and I can get you the information if you're interested. How about that? Um, and I can get you an email address to, to email. See, look at that. This is, this is why we hired Justin as the budget director. Uh, 501 is the, uh, the phone. Uh, and then assessment appeal, A-S-S-E-S-S-M-E-N-T-A-P-P-E-A-L, all one word, at Henrico.us is the email address. And you'll get a call back or a response immediately. And someone will come out and take a look at your property and, uh, and, and handle your claim. I know that was very brief, and that was intentional. Uh, but do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the rate itself stays the same, exactly. When real estate prices, the values of the homes, or assessments went up dramatically, that's when the board came way down on the rate to try to level it off a little bit. So the times we went down were times in, in the 90s and the early you know, 2000s where it shot way up. We came way down. When I first moved into the county, the rate was... Uh, over a dollar. It was, I think it was one dollar and two cents. I think it was a dollar and two cents, and now it's at 87 cents. Yes, the value of my house has gone up, fortunately, in 40 years. <laughs> but with that said, um, we keep, that's why we go down. Many other jurisdictions leave it or go up, and then they just get more and more money. We try to be very efficient with the money. That's the point. Yes, I'm afraid it, it eventually does go up, but then we will come down if it, we feel it goes up too much. Do you recall when it was going up about 20% in one year, some of the prices of values went up 17, 20%? This year it was around 6% uh, or 7%. I think the average was 4.5%. I think it was. The average value, yes. Uh, so we try to, again, we try to balance the idea that more money will come in, but we also wanted to give our the, the folks that worked for Henrico County, I, I'll never forget the guys that did in, the home, home inspections and had to, uh, the community maintenance people that would go out, would each get two or three people would be in a car, and they were saving gas and being sure they would take one trip. I mean, the employees were just great about not spending money there when times were really tough. So the board always has felt we want to pay them back for being frugal and doing the, you know, doing a job well, but for a, a lower amount of money or not spending as much. They really cut back on expenses for many years, for several years there. Are there any other questions in general? Because I know there's some here who want to talk about the development, and that's why Mr. Wilhite's here, and I'll stay there too, and we'll discuss it. But is there anyone else? Because did anyone how online have a question? Because we have had several people viewing us online, and we appreciate that, and thank you, and I hope you heard what was going on. No questions? Very good, thank you. Really appreciate. They said, Henrico, uh, Tuckahoe is among the top, and Henrico is one of the top 20 counties in the U.S. So we went about an hour and 15, and we try to keep it in an hour. So thank you very much. Yes, there's a storm outside. I hope you brought an umbrella. So thank you very much. <laughs>